Good day, everyone. This is Jack Van Horn uh, from the University of Southern California um, and the uh, Big Data to Knowledge uh, Training Coordinating Center. Um, and I'd like to welcome you to this, our final in our series of uh, Guide to the Fundamentals of Data Science seminar series uh, to where this, uh, today we're very delighted to have uh, Dr. Patricia Flatley Brennan, uh, Director of the National Library of Medicine and Interim Associate NIH Director for Data Science, uh, speaking on data science at the NIH, current state and future directions. Uh, we're very delighted to have Dr. Brennan, um, who uh, is the former Lillian L. Uh, Molman Boscom Professor at the School of Nursing and College of Engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, where she led the uh, Living Environments Laboratory at the Wisconsin Institutes for Discovery, developed computer link and electronic network uh, designed to reduce isolation and improve self-care amongst uh, health, home care patients, and uh, directed heart care, uh, directed health design. She has a long list uh, of uh, accolades, and her, her CV must be pages and pages and chapters long. Uh, in particular, uh, most recently, uh, she has um, been um, uh, the director of the uh, National Library of Medicine uh, since August of 2016, and uh, recently, as of January of 2017, took on the role of the Interim Associate NIH Director for, for Data Science, um, the ADS office uh, that many of you are familiar with. Um, and as, uh, as part of that, she is in uh, a leadership position for uh, the BD2K Enterprise, many of which you participate in. So we're very delighted to uh, get some uh, insights from her about the current state of data science at the NIH, what future directions hold uh, through uh, data science at the NIH for biomedical research, um, progress in, in uh, all manner of data mining and computation and informatics, et cetera. So we're very delighted to, to have Dr. Brennan. And I would like to ask you that if you have any questions for Dr. Brennan, please use the uh, GoToWebinar uh, question submission feature, and uh, you can submit your questions. And then about 10 minutes before the hour, we'll uh, take those questions. I'll read them off to her, and she'll get a chance to answer. So without further delay, uh, Dr. Brennan, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much, and I appreciate the kind introduction. I thank all of you for taking time out of your day today. If it's as beautiful where you are as it is here in Washington, you're missing a bright, sunny, but rather hot day outside to participate in this last of the uh, big data, uh, data science seminars held uh, now for almost a full year. I want to say how happy I am to be a part of this seminar series and how glad I am to be at this point in time. Certainly there have been some notable speakers that have gone ahead of me bringing you both technical solutions, I hope, and new perspectives in thinking about data and data science. My role today is to accomplish four things with you. First, I want to give you an update on what's going on at NIH with data science. There's many things. It's a vibrant, active part of our mission. Um, second, I want to provide you with some of my views and perspectives on data science so you can understand how I'm approaching this challenge and perhaps guide me with your ideas of how to make sure we create a robust infrastructure for discovery. Um, third, I'm going to explain our near-term and, and out-year efforts in both the uh, intramural NIH campus level investments as well as our national investments in data science. And finally, and I hope to actually save even more time than the 10 minutes at the end, to get your thoughts and ideas about how the NIH can facilitate data science, data-driven discovery, and the clinical practice and health improvement of our country based on investments in data-driven resources. I want you to think about uh, what kind of services would be needed in the future? What kind of supports do you need? Are you looking forward to certain types of granting programs, certain types of methodological issues? Should we be thinking about workforce development? Those kinds of resources I would very much appreciate your guidance on. And I'm going to ask Crystal and the organizers if they can record all of the uh, comments that come in, even if we don't get to address all of them in our conversation today. Let me begin um, by taking you to the end. Why, why do we actually want to invest in data science? We believe that fundamentally data science is a pathway to discovery, is a new and essential pathway to discovery, and along that pathway there are opportunities, there are challenges, and there's a need for some direction. The idea that data, will, data drives discovery 
is a fundamental shift, not simply in the methods we use, but in the way we conduct research. And at NIH, this commitment is very strong, and it begins at the highest level of leadership. Dr. Collins is personally invested in how to create the proper infrastructure for data science. The BD2K program that was familiar to most of you over the years what began as, a, as an inquiry spurned on by the, um, the enormous amount of data being generated through genomic and proteomic studies in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s. A realization that we needed to enable biomedical sciences to capitalize on the data being generated by research communities. And so the BD2K program uh, launched through after a series of workshops held um, that met with many different sectors, many different stakeholders and came to focus on the idea that we needed to provide training infrastructure, we needed to stimulate all types of research in, the, in new areas about data, we needed to stimulate basic methodological in inquiry, as well as investment in the infrastructure needed to support data. And what you see on the screen here is our homepage for data science at NIH. And I call your attention to the, the, the bar at the bottom, which describes the data science community, the big data to knowledge process, and the commons. The data science community is broader than anyone ever expected, bringing in not only genomics-based researchers, but also people with advanced analytics, machine learning and artificial intelligence specialists, even bringing in engineers and computer scientists and designing new data models, new kinds of resources and storage strategies. In addition, the library sciences community has played an increasingly large role as part of the data science community with their skills in curation, standard setting, dissemination, and collection management. We organize a lot of the thinking around data science under the concept of a commons, and we'll return to this phrase several times. I know you've had other discussions about it earlier uh, throughout this year. Uh, from the perspective of the NIH at this point in time, the commons is both a concept as well as a physical space. And we'll be talking about some of the work that's being done to set up the NIH commons. The idea is the commons provides a safe harbor for data to be, be stored, but also a pathway for data to be accessed and used. Um, we envision the data commons as not only serving a, a, as a repository for data, but also as a suite of services, resources for modeling, for curation, and for establishing uh, a good catalog of data and information. Let me speak to you specifically about the BD2K program right now, for that's what brought a lot of people into this process. As you, you know, the BD2K program was intended to be about a $125, $130 million initiative per year over about an eight-year period. And we're about halfway through this period. At this time, with the departure of Phil Bourne and the reorganization of the Associate Director of Data Science Office, we've had many discussions with the NIH leadership about how to make sure we're getting the, the yield and value out of the NIH investment in the Big Data to Knowledge Commons, the Big Data to Knowledge Project, excuse me. We anticipate that this project will continue from now through its intended uh, target date of 2021, and the project is, is fully funded through this period of time. And yet there are changes that are being made. Those changes are summarized um, in a blog post that we provided on February the 23rd. The link to the blog post is, is on the, the, uh, the screen in front of you. But essentially, let me summarize what's in that blog post. First, we have a, the BD2K program. Um, resources were designed to provide extramural support, that is, out of NIH support, for data discovery, data curation, and data management. We remain committed to all existing programs, and so they will be funded at their originally intended level. All programs that will act that are active, as, this was as of January, but continues through now. All programs that are active will be funded through the endpoint of their. Um, the, their period of time, many of them winding up by August of 2018. We added one new funding, a uh, new program uh, funding this spring, and that was an initiative on curation that had been released prior to the, um, the, the, the planned pivoting of the BD2K program, and that was that the, the announcements about those funding that the funding of those new projects will come out during the summer. They are specifically targeting innovations in curation, including some very exciting uses of, of natural language processing to facilitate automated curation. We are also at this time 
um, considering and, and putting together the think tank within NIH to plan for future needs, including training, research, infrastructure, and policy development. What's important about this is during the process of pivoting from the extramural program to the next phase of BD2K, we recognize that we have a rapidly growing amount of data that still lacks a safe place for storage. So during this two-year period of time, we are investing more in creating NIH-based resources for our high-value data sets and for access for researchers to begin to compute on those data sets. I'll return to that com those comments in a few minutes after we talk about, in general, the process of discovery through data. But remember, I'm hoping that you will continue to, to jot down your thoughts and think about how the NIH can foster data-driven discovery as you perceive it from your own workplace and your own work career. But let's pause for a moment and think about where discoveries originate from and why the NIH should be investing in creating an infrastructure for discovery. Early discoveries in the health sciences were originated through the process of experience. A, an individual, a clinician, a healer worked with a patient, worked with a person in need, made observations about what happened, the response, hopefully an improvement because of additional sunshine, certain herbs or maybe certain kinds of medication. These processes of experience were translated to written documents and the pathway for discovery became a one-time experience with an individual shared in a narrative or heuristic fashion. As we moved to the late 18, early 19th uh, century, we began to see the embracing of experimental design as a pathway to discovery. Experimental design had lots of advantages. It allowed us to to, to focus specifically on phenomenon, to maybe discern the pathway that explained why certain phenomenon occurred in a certain fashion or did not occur. It let us determine which techniques worked better than others. Increasingly, experiments also brought about a perspective on science that allowed for excluding or, or controlling for variability in the process that was being observed by ensuring that careful procedures were followed, by ensuring that, that certain variables, certain aspects of the phenomenon were highlighted and others were not attended to, and precision in measurement and understanding allowed for a process of discovery. This philosophy was a very, what I would call, a particularistic approach to discovery that essentially required the investigator to design a priori an experiment that had the appropriate variables, the appropriate manipulations, and the appropriate controls, and allowing and learning through prior studies, for example, or through study of the literature, what aspects of the phenomenon needed to be attended to and what could be ignored. Part of the, the value of experimentation was its narrowness of focus, but part of the limitation was its narrowness of focus. And increasingly over time, experiments generated more and more data. As we moved into the 60s in the, in the U.S. and around the world, computation became an important complement to the experimental design. Computation now let, freed us from being overly restricted on the number of variables that could be observed and analyzed at the same time and allowed for an increasing augmentation not only of the research process but of the cognition of the individual who was trying to understand phenomenon and plot the pathway through. We now are moving into what I think of as the fourth generation of discovery processes and that is data-driven discovery. Here we are freed from the constraints that experiments once required us to adhere to, that is a limitation in the number of variables or a limitation in the consideration of what aspects needed to be considered. And brought us, it brings us to us the ability to understand phenomenon in context in much greater detail. The challenge of managing this information as a process of discovery is going to require changes in the way we think about the substrate, the infrastructure to support discovery. When we, move, when we think of a data-driven era of discovery, we're envisioning data as a substrate that is both generated by experiments and observations and then becomes subsequently later on the substance that future discoveries are rest on. So we see a process here of accelerating discovery, activities conducted once can be, generate data that can be reused many times. Fundamentally, data-driven discovery rests on two aspects, data and computation. I'm not going to re go into too much depth about the data, the FAIR principles of data. I'm sure they're well familiar to the audience that we're speaking. But for those of you who may be less 
familiar with him, I let me just say say forward that the there is a, a acceptance around the world that for data driven discovery we must have a quality of data that makes sure that that, that that those data are findable, are accessible, are interoperable, and reusable. For data to be findable, we need to attend to the labeling, the metadata, the curation of the data to ensure it's, it's, it is locatable through machine interaction. That begins with making sure the data are well labeled and cataloged and described in a way that can be discovered. Ensuring that data are accessible is not only a technical challenge, but it's also a challenge of ensuring the, the, that the authentication and authorization to use data sets is appropriately managed so that data are managed in a respected and respectable fashion. Interoperability uh, is the, the, that characteristic that we trust will lead us to be able to link data sets from more than one environment, from more than one experiment across several experiments. The interoperability of data requires the find that data be findable, that is terms be used in a similar and, and consistent fashion, but also that they be accessible through platforms that allow the transmission of analytics as well as the transmission of the data themselves. Fundamentally, in data-driven discovery, the principle of reusability governs what we do. That is, we start from an original experiment moving on to a recognition that the data generated from one experiment needs to be placed in a, a storage strategy that is accessible to others. But reusability, like our other three characteristics of data, um, is not simply a technical challenge, but it's also a social, social challenge. Reusable data ex and discovery driven by reusable data sets is a shift in the way research is done and valued. Primary investigation often was considered the hallmark of the best practices of research, and secondary analysis, while useful, was not often awarded the same level of, of respect and consideration in terms of its value. Increasingly, we are now realizing that one single experiment, even one that is very designed in a very complex fashion, engaging a lot of investigators, still doesn't allow us, it doesn't yield all of the findings that that the data set generated in that experiment could yield. And so we now need to think not only how to make that data reusable, but how to make reusable data-driven discovery approaches to research as valued, as, as useful for society as our experimental models. Computational challenges remain. Data science is not simply statistics on steroids or bioinformatics with large groups, large sets of data, but really requires us to think about ways we can bring in new kinds of analytics. One of the values of data-driven discovery is that we are freed of the assumptions that must be met in order to be able to use classic statistics and DeFinetti models. We are able now to take data in its natural form and use that data in a way to help discover it by considering different approaches to analytics, and I call your attention to developments in three areas that I find particularly promising. Distributed analytics, machine learning, and <clears throat> excuse me, and optimization. Distributed analytics allow us to essentially bring analytic tools to where the data reside and return the results of an analysis to be compiled and integrated in the fashion. This is a, a marked departure from our usual multi-site clinical trials models where data are collected in one place and gathered in, in a, a, second, a, a central place for subsequent analysis. Distributed analytics have a power to be able to look at, at different phenomena over time, but importantly also have, have the promise of ensuring uh, privacy preservation so the data themselves are not transported, only the analytics from the data. Machine learning strategies, particularly deep learning, bring a chance to understand data from its, its basic discovery model and then require a, a, a interpretation based on the frameworks and the theories that are brought by domain science. The values of machine learning is that they, or it lies in the fact that the, the patterning that is, is assessed is not constrained by certain underlying assumptions of the data, but rather can be brought forward based on the existence of the data itself. Essentially, we have a semantic free discovery strategy that later requires interpretation. This, by way, is also one of the downfalls. Many machine learning results are difficult to explain to domain scientists or clinicians and therefore require an, a, a longer pathway to explanation. Optimization is an approach brought in by from uh, operations research that allows us to look at, at pathways through data sets 
discovering from the millions of possible trajectories, for example, or the millions of possible samples that could be drawn, which are the ones that would be most promising. Optimization gives us a chance to, to approach data in a more principled fashion so that we can make the best use of the analytic powers available for the data scientist discovery. I'm particularly, I see particular promise in visualization strategies, and two in particular, visual analytics, the use of analytical display, the use of visual displays of data as an assistance in the process of analysis, and also in depicting results. One of the challenges of data science is that while it's not restricted to very large data sets, it's often uh, employed in, very, in the analysis of very large data sets, ones that are not human readable or too large for a human to comprehend and so the visualization tools allow us the opportunities to explore these data sets and, and examine, bring in human judgment as needed. It's important to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the computational challenges for the management of data. We have a great need to put in place good business processes that allow for access, access control, management, and, uh, for, and the uh, attempt to preserve the proper alignment of the permission to use the data with the individual choosing to use it. Business management processes are also needed to help us in, 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 to anticipate the value of a data set and the potential cost of curation and the, the cost of reuse of data sets so we can put proper pricing strategies in place. Uh, another ch management challenge that we face is the preservation of the provenance of analytical strategies. The enormous size of data sets and the teams working with them often leads us to having a very confused pipeline and the, and the increasing reliance on pipeline approaches to maintaining the, the, the history of the analysis done with a particular data set will enable us to discover it in a more, re more reliable fashion. Finally, maintaining version control of the data set, I think, believe presents a particular challenge that I think the National Library of Medicine may have some particular skills to solve. One of the things that we realize is once data sets are acquired, new investigators bring new enrichment strategies to them and require and make, make modifications that may be well understood by that individual. This brings us a need, to us a need for managing version control for having the proper tools in place so that a basic data set remains intact, but the enhancements and enrichments done by other investigators also main, remain accessible to the community as it, as it emerges. I'd like to talk to you now about where I see the National Library of Medicine fitting into this process. About three years ago at NIH, a study was done, reported to the director of NIH, that said that the National Library of Medicine should become the epicenter of data science for the NIH. Now, epicenter has sort of a bad meaning in some places, the center of an earthquake or the center of destruction, and I certainly hope the National Library of Medicine does not become the center of destruction. But I do believe with our long history over almost 200 years of support for discovery in our country and around the world, the National Library of Medicine will play an important role in accelerating data science. Let me show you a brief video that will introduce you to some of the products and services that the National Library of Medicine currently is involved with, and then we'll talk about how we're going to be participating in the data-driven discoveries of the future.
This video introduced you to some of our treasures and some of our products. I'm sure you're well familiar with PubMed. Many of you probably also use dbGaP. Our PubMed, our citation database, has over 26 and a half million citations to the biomedical literature, to articles around the world, and is in and adds almost a million citations every year. Our resources are also, though, used by young children and families around the world. You saw Medline Plus. You saw um, the young, the the wonderment on the young child as he heard the voice of a native healer. We preserve the healing traditions of the country. We also provide training. We also provide various ways to make sure our resources are used. You might have been wondering why we show that slide of malaria and that cup of water with the, the bugs in it. We are trying to use our image processing analysis to provide in the field detection of, of different diseases so that in under-resourced country we're able to take the knowledge of the library into the decision-making process in the laboratory as quickly as possible. So we do primarily support research but our, our resources, driven by the need to support research, are used globally. Four million times a day to PubMed Central, 300,000 times a day to dbGaP. Millions of individuals access our work. And you saw our pathogen detection process that's now used every day by public health authorities around the country trying to determine the exact nature of an E. coli or a listeria outbreak. Essentially, our future builds on our past, and we are ready to take leadership in the area of data science around the country. But let me take you back to the very first slides you saw. We began indexing in 1838, and from a, for almost 135 years, we've, we worked to develop an index of the medical literature so that it could be located and discovered and used by researchers and clinicians. Starting in the 70s, we began to digitize our, our indexing tools so they could be accessed and searched and then with the advent of the internet in 1984 we began to look at how our resources could be used by individuals around the world without this mediation of a specialist like a librarian. We face the so many similar challenges today with data as we faced in, our pa in the past with managing the literature, making sure that we have access to it, making sure our, our investigators know how to use it, providing a pathway for people to report and, 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 and present their findings of their research. So we believe we will be able to manage the, the, and support the data-driven discoveries I'd like to focus on five or six key areas that were guiding our plans and our investment here. The first is the development and determination of high value data sets. High value data sets are data sets that are worthy of preservation because of their potential for future discovery from them. Now, a high-value data set may be a data set likely to be used by a lot of individuals. You can think of the Framingham study or the GTEx resource uh, that's being developed through the Common Fund as types of high-value data sets or the model organism databases. But in addition, sometimes data sets are of high value because they're unique and not able to be, dis not able to be replicated. We have the process of determining high value data set occurs at multiple times in the research process. First, of course, at the point of inception of the original research that creates the data set. It's worthy to think about what might the future life of that data set be? How long will it be useful? Under what circumstances? That will help guide subsequent decisions about it. Secondly, at the closing of a research process, which is the point at which many of the curation decisions are made, the determination, again, of which aspects of a data set are high valued and must be preserved helps to guide investments in curation. And subsequent to that, Determining the high value data sets will help us in understanding how to ensure that those data sets become discoverable, knowable, and reachable by investigators who intend to use them. Essentially, a determination of high value data sets leads us to being able to preserve with a purpose. There is no point in preserving every single data element ever generated in research, but we do need to be able to make preservation decisions that are useful to the community of discovery driven research as well as useful to, to the public as a whole. So our preservation has to consider, for example, how likely is a data set to be reused? Is it going to be reused by a small community of people who are well familiar with the data set? Or is it a larger community that will have, will have interest and access in that data set? We need to use the preservation strat strategies to decide the nature of metadata that gets attached to data sets, what type of storage resource should it be in a close and easily accessible online, or is a tape backup safe storage use acceptable for a particular data set? 
Finally, the preservation helps us know how to market the existence and the availability of the data sets. We talk a lot about metadata, metadata being the, the, the process of attaching information to a data set and to the data elements within a data set. We believe that using standard approaches to these is, a, is the only way to ensure the findability of the data sets, and yet generating standards is a, is a complex and a task that needs to be undertaken in a systematic fashion. We see a lot of interest in the biological communities about community-driven standards, which are a reasonable starting point. But as you see with the list of standards across the, the bar in the center of this, the kinds of standards we've used in clinical data management have been the result of balancing individual unique communities, LOINC being a laboratory community, SNOMED CT being the, uh, uh, the, the clinical care community, with the, the other um, potential users, participants in, this, in the data use. RxNorm, for example, is a merger of, of data standards for medications that draw both from the, the pharmaceutical companies as well as from the clinical care facilities. We believe the National Library of Medicine has a, a process in place and a history of developing standards and can serve as both as a clearinghouse and as an integrator of standards. We don't make the standards, but we make the standards accessible. Another aspect that the National Library of Medicine is, is keenly aware that we need to invest in across all of NIH is generating new tools for discovery and analysis. The methodologies that we have now, some are very specifically tied to a specific data set or a specific domain where the discoveries occurred. We're looking to develop both de deeply uh, tied and analytical methods, that is, analytical methods that are unique to particular areas, as well as broad-based ones, so we can get efficiencies across our environments. We see a great need for promoting training. This, this session is but one of the approaches to training development that needs to be brought forward to, it as, to the society. Training, we see it addressing three different key groups. The first are basic data scientists. These are the, the, the new algorithm developers, the new methodological developers. The second type of training we need are data sophisticated investigators, domain specific investigators who have the knowledge and the insights of how to work with data science and data scientists to, to enhance the discoveries in their area. And finally, we need data informed front end workers, be they clinicians or librarians or even patients who are able to understand, access and make use of the products of data driven science. Data-driven science doesn't happen alone, and it's not only going to happen within, just it can't happen only within the NIH-funded community, but it needs to be done in partnership across the federal government, across the international borders, and we work very closely with the Wellcome Trust, with GA4GH, and a number of uh, groups that are advancing standards and policies around data sharing. We recognize that data does not know country boundaries, does not recognize, and science is not held by a single country. The international efforts that the National Library of Medicine has been engaged in for years will help guide us in the engagement with our international partners to ensure free-flowing data and information around the world. I want to pause for just a minute and remind you that the end point of data science is the health of individuals in our society. And whether they be an investigator, such as the, the woman on the left, or a clinician, the gentleman on the right, or a patient, we have an ultimate end user. And while I don't expect every single scientist and every data scientist to have an outreach component of their work that ensures that the everyday layperson understands and benefits from their work, I do believe it is a responsibility of the NIH to make sure that our resources and our discoveries are accessible and known and useful to an extremely broad range of individuals, including the very moment of care at the end user place. Let me close by talking a little bit about where we're going next with the integration with BD2K and the investments in new, in new data science tools in the short run and in the next few years at NIH. The BD2K program has been quite a success developing new methods, giving us experience with testing out um, moving of data sets, integration of data sets, and we will continue to build with them. The program, the BD2K program, has moved to the Common Fund within our Division of Program Planning and Evaluation, and the, 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 the BD2K program uh, uh, investigators continue to meet and are organized through uh, uh, Dr. Betsy Wilder's office there in the Common Fund. 
The activities that the BD2K program is supporting right at this time from January of 17 until August of, uh, through August of 18 is to synthesize and collect learnings from the centers of excellence of which there were 12 to conduct the Commons pilots. Now this program name in the last two weeks has changed to the Vanguard. Within the Vanguard, what was originally known as the Commons pilots, three high value data sets, TopMed, GTEx, and the MODS will be or have been identified and will be prepared for storage in a common structure that will be a cloud-based structure. The plan is to establish a foundation for authentication, authorization, and curation that is scalable but specifically gives us experience with taking high-value data sets and moving them into a cloud environment. There will be um, and uh, I, I, uh, much attention given to the cost of managing data and moving data to a cloud environment to make it more accessible, make it more reusable and interoperable, and also the experience of investigators and their investigator teams at the institutions, both in terms of data deposit as well as in terms of, of actually using and operating on the data. Um, we expect also to be stimulating new inquiry in this area and, uh, and, uh, and releasing some, releasing at least one funding an announcement to specifically conduct analysis on uh, two or more of these high value data sets, top men and GTEx, for example, or the MODS. There will be a, a new funding opportunity a new funding opportunity released this summer before the end of fiscal 17, which will be um, done under our other transactions authority. So it won't be a straight, it won't be a research-based grant, but we're looking for partnerships to develop the authentication and authorization strategies to establish a curation approach and also to help with the logistics of making transitions to cloud environments feasible for more people. There will also, there continues to be investment in training. Our BD2K T32 programs are continuing. And as I indicated earlier, there is an investment in curation. All of these are, are, have been uh, are currently funded. Our extensions into new programs awaits fiscal 18 when I expect to see new funding announcements come forward. We are, though, emphasizing our development of the infrastructure on the NIH campus. In front of you is a picture of most of the campus. The, one of our big buildings to the right is missing. Um, that funny uh, uh, diamond-shaped uh, building with the diamond-shaped top on it, that's the National Library of Medicine. We're right at the front edge of the campus. We will be building the Commons framework as um, is depicted here. And this is from Warren Kibbe and Vivian Benazzi's work of to get you to understand that what, we're, what we believe we're building at NIH is a compute platform that will be managed through commercial cloud services. We will be putting in place Dockerizers, containers for, for uh, creating uh, packaging of applications and developing a digital object identifier process Test it out first with these three high value data sets. We are going to be integrating some of the APIs that were developed under the BD2K program and developing new ones and also enhancing the search process and serve for discoverability and findability. At the National, in National Library of Medicine, we are also involved in, in moving data science um, into our portfolio. We are in the process of partnering with groups to work on creating the, me the, the mechanisms to determine high value data sets and, for and creating specifically forecasting cost and utilization is the, is the emphasis of the program we're doing here. We will be implementing efficient secure, and secure preservation strategies that facilitate access and reuse. Beginning in December of this year, we will be opening the, um, uh, the PubMed central to allow data deposit with articles at that as, as they are entered into PubMed. That will be our first step at opening a, a secure preservation strategy that makes data accessible through individual articles. We will be um, continuing to stimulate intramural efforts in standards development um, and try to, to um, bring some order and organization to the standards processes. Um, developing new methods for data management and data-driven discovery. Our methodological discoveries are, for, are emphasizing in the um, natural language processing area and in machine learning specifically for the short row. Our workforce investment continues. We have a, a, many of our NLM training programs now have added a data science dimension. We anticipate opening a new data management training program in the future. No, and the, in the T32 uh, and perhaps the, the F31 mechanism. We continue to engage across the government, particularly with NSF 
and with NOAA to look at, at safe and efficient strategies for data management and storage and hope to be um, expanding this and will be expanding this through, through collaborations with others. Finally, um, we are doing all of this under a concept of fostering of the idea of open science, of making science accessible to the community to ensure that the, the process from discovery, from initial inception of what, uh, what research ideas are interesting to pursue to what research should be pursued, what funding should be done to actually opening and inter to actually interpreting and, and disseminating the information, being done in a way that actually brings more openness, engaging industry, engaging science, society, and also engaging the individuals who have the ability to lead in a scientific workforce development. Finally, then we, went, we are absolutely committed to making sure that the findings from the BD2K program are, and the cloud pilots, the Vanguard program now, are made available and accessible to as broad of a community as possible. A key aspect of this for our work here is going to be the establishment of a structure for the development of the data science infrastructure at, at NIH. And I, I deliberately selected this image of this series of blocks because what I, I, I envision in the future is we will have a highly distributed data structure. Our data commons at NIH will be but one of the commons is where data will be residing in the future. And our goals for developing this and our goals for making sure data are accessible and knowable across a large community uh, require us to have in place a stable structure that guides the acquisition, ingestion, development, and, and distribution of data as it goes forward. I envision there will be an, a, a division with the National Library of Medicine that focuses specifically on data science, and it will partner with our data science investigators around the NIH, both in the intramural and the extramural programs. I also envision that the resources that are already in place in the National Library of Medicine will help us reach the public better. So our community of the National Networks of Libraries of Medicine, which provide us with 6,500 points of presence around the country, will have in place uh, libraries and library resources that can assist institutions and universities and investigators to develop effective methods for working with data. Increasingly in our academic health science centers, we're seeing that our librarians are taking a key role in helping investigators prepare their data for, de for deposit and also to identify and locate and manage large data sets, much the same way that we did the literature. So the librarians aren't going to do the data science the same way the librarians didn't do the basic science that created the articles that grew out of investigations, but instead they're going to provide a, the facilitation, the information infrastructure for science. We believe also through the National Li Network of Libraries of Medicine that we will be able to help the general public better understand where data-driven discoveries affect their lives. For example, participants in the All of Us program, which intends to obtain biological samples as well as, as other types of assessments from over a million people will, it will be best served if there's a library in the community that can help people understand what it means when one gets an individual test result back from or an individual genetic profile back through the All of Us program. Having trusted information resources that are able to support the data-driven enterprise is both the endpoint of the data-driven discovery process as well as a service that we believe the government can provide. I am, will leave you now with just one announcement that you may have heard before, but an important leader in the data science initiative at NIH will be leaving us. Dr. David Littman, the founding director of the NCBI, is going to be stepping down next week after almost 30 years of service to NIH. He greatly improved our access to biomedical information and genomic inter information. His discoveries of BLAST, his standing up of the dbGaP, and his critical, important uh, offerings from the National Library of Medicine and the NIH. Dr. Lippmann is making a major career change. He's going to be assuming the position of the chief science officer at Impossible Foods, which is a, a new company in California that's applying molecular biology to the food industry to create vegan-based foods. We wish Dr. Lippmann his great success, but recognize that many of the comments that I made today and mention the vision of data science at NIH was shaped by this brilliant colleague, and I am grateful for his work. 
I'll close by, oh, I forgot one, one more picture of him, sorry. Um, Dr. Lippman was around at the very beginning of the, uh, the development of the NCBI. You see him here with Claude Pepper and Dr. Uh, Lindbergh um, as he is, uh, is showing, um, as they were discussing this, the launch of NCBI before it became what it, what it is today, which was a great and incredible resource for data. And I close by now showing you, you can reach me in many ways through um, a blog called Musings at the Mezzanine, which focuses on the National Library of Medicine resources, another blog called Data Science at NIH, which um, focuses on our data science activities here. Um, I'm on Twitter and pretty active, and I'm also available by email. I now hope I've given us enough time to have some conversation about uh, the directions for the future, and I welcome your thoughts and your ideas. Thanks very much. Dr. Brennan, thank you so much for that uh, wonderful overview of data science uh, uh, from the NIH. Uh, it seems very comprehensive and, and, and a lot of thought seems to have gone into what the future of, of data science is going to be uh, at the NIH uh, moving forward. Um, there are a number of questions, as you might imagine, um, from a <laughs> comprehensive talk like yours. And let me see if I can, I probably can't get to all of them, but uh, per your request, I will try and copy all of them and I'll forward them to you so that you can kind of get a sense of the, the, the things that people are curious about. But I'll, I'll sample a few and maybe you can address them. Um, I know that uh, there was a lot of discussion about the, the commons and about the role that that's going to play. And uh, there was some questions about the role of existing kind of data sharing uh, efforts that are being done through the NIH. Um, for example, like the um, National Cancer Institute's Genomics Data Commons. I know there's some work uh, that was uh, spearheaded uh, formerly by Dr. Insel at the NIMH, for example, the Autism Centers of Excellence, um, where you're expected to uh, provide your data as a condition of your funding to the National Database of Autism Research and other programs. How will those uh, play a role? Will they benefit? Will they become partners in the new data commons. How do you see that working? Well, I'm going to take you back to my, my uh, I hope I'm going to take you back to my slide um, um, to, um, to show you that the structure that we envision is, if you will, a highly distributed structure. So the NIH data commons will be but one of what we envision as a whole network of of commonses and data repositories around the world. And our, our challenges in creating proper discovery mechanisms, catalogs, for example, is not that is not dissimilar to the challenge that was originally faced when the World Wide Web and the domain uh, name servers had to come about. So we, we're, we're at the beginning of, of needing to be able to locate and share at the level of repositories and then at the level of data sets. We envision that we work very closely with Warren Kibbing and, and the, the Cancer Genome uh, Commons and also with the Brain Initiative, with the Autism Commons, and we do not see those as being in any way um, closed by this process, by, by creating an NIH Data Commons, but rather the NIH Data Commons is, is yet another participant in this activity of, of data sharing. Now I will say that at this point in time, all of the focus in developing the NIH Commons is, is targeted around known data sets. And um, we see going forward that the models for, for, for curating known data sets might be slightly different than the models for curating new data sets. And again, we're working with a trans-NIH group to make sure that we, we, we first of all, don't, don't tie ourselves to an, an, arch an archiving model that actually isn't as robust as the future will need, but second, so that we don't lose our connections to those models. Let me say just uh, briefly, we expect that we will be connecting the data commons infrastructure will connect to data commons, our data, other data repositories held in different places, including within universities, including at research institutes and in other countries. Um, the negotiation of what constitutes access um, exchange what kinds of, of compute resources are going to be available will will I believe uh, make make for a subst substantial amount of conversation as well as 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 indexing of resources over the next few years. Um, we're at, at an early stage of this. We we fundamentally believe a distributed structure is essential. When one makes a commitment to a distributed structure, one makes a commitment to invest in discovery tools as much as analytic tools. Yeah, that was another. Uh kind of series of questions had to do with uh, the role of tools. Even though the commons is being constructed uh, now at the NIH itself, will there be op 
do you envision future opportunities for people who develop tools which leverage the commons and the data in it and its metadata um, as part of you know new some of your new funding uh, initiatives that you see uh, on the horizon? Absolutely, um, I'm quite committed to method to accelerating methods developments, um, which uh, which is necessary a necessary precursor to to accelerating knowledge development. Um, I believe we are considering. Um, for example, what does a library of models look like? Um, how do we how do we curate models the way we've curated the literature so the models become so an executable version of a model becomes accessible and knowable? Um, we also so we so we anticipate that we're going to have to invest in three areas with respect to models. First, of course, model model development, and we work uh, with the intergovernment modeling and anal modeling analysis and, and simulation group um, on the beginning parts of the step. But in addition, we have we, we know we need to find a way to distribute models more effectively than as, in the text narrative of an article or as an appendage to an article. So we are looking to to find a, a, a mechanism for um, create constructing model libraries, libraries of, of uh, discoverable models of libraries. And finally, we need to find ways that where we can efficiently link models and data sets in a way that allows for, for um, allows them to be interrogated but isn't isn't terribly redundant or, or uh, complex in its organization and by that I mean that as, as a model is modified for a particular data set it, it is really important to be able to recover that exact instance of the model with that data set if one wants to try to reproduce a set of findings and we have uh, the way we do this in the literature right now is we have a citation database. We have investigators describe uh, uh, their their background or, or place their work in a certain scientific tradition, and then uh, use text to describe the procedures they will be doing for their their, their to carry out an experiment or that that they did use to carry out an experiment. As we move into data driven discovery, we need to be thinking about different ways of of, of documenting the scientific process as well as archiving that documentation. So I see a whole range of new scientific communication tools emerging along with the discovery tools and the analytical tools. You know, it was very interesting that you mentioned, uh, or you mentioned uh, libraries. Uh, one of the things that at least I have learned through uh, our running of these data science seminar series is the interest and uh, potential source of energy, if you will, uh, that comes from librarians and library scientists um, and their potential role here. And uh, we had a question from someone asking, uh, will the National Library of Medicine be hiring additional uh, librarians who have data science kind of experience? So this, um, following a trend across the country, apparently. This is a great question. Um, it would surprise, not maybe not everyone, but certainly surprised me when I first came here last summer, um, that we have 1,700 men and women that work here at the National Library of Medicine, and we only have 97 librarians, um, which tells you that the work of a library takes a lot of different disciplines together, not not uh, the least of which is librarians. We do anticipate that that we will be uh, that our library operations group, which manages the the collection that we have, that is, what do we physically own, as well as the curation, our our our, our Medline Plus, um, excuse me, our Medline um, literature uh, citation process, will be enriched with uh, with individuals who will be helping with the data the the data curation process. What we expect to have happen. Um, and I an anticipated the development of something that might look like a PubMed for data. Now, people here don't like me to say it quite that way because it's not a direct equivalent. But just as we have a, a, a journal uh, archive tagging system, JAT system, we are in the process of working with the BioCaddy group to, to refine the DATS, D-A-T-S, which is a data archiving tagging system. So we will be able to to put a, 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 a high-level metadata structure that will enable us to catalog data. That will require that we we um, use the library science skills in, in, in cataloging and creating indexing so individuals can find the data sets. And just as we don't hold every article that is list, listed in Medline, we would not hold, that is, be the, the, the owner of every data set that is listed in a data catalog, but rather provide the pathway to it. I see librarians as having two other really key roles. Uh, library science, librarians, uh, if in brought into research projects from the very beginning, can help the research team describe the data management plan in a way that addresses sustainability. 
and ensures that met, that 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 the metadata, even the early uh, uh, curation, can occur as data is being acquired, not not simply waited till the data set is complete. And the second aspect is that our library science community is going to be of great assistance to our investigators and frankly to the public in general, small businesses, industry, in, in actually locating data sets because the process of searching for data sets and locating them is, is slightly, it's not, it's not nearly as, um, as refined as this process of searching for the literature. So we'll need all the library science tech, talent we can get. <laughs> That's probably going to be good news to a, a number of people. Uh, you mentioned um, uh, data sharing plans, and I know that uh, the NIH has been very interested in increasing uh, the uh, description of how people will be sharing their data across a variety of grants. Uh, typically, these have been at the more uh, the expensive end of the, the grant spectrum, if you will, but uh, this is increasingly uh, suspected that it's going to be coming down to R01s and R21s, et cetera. How does the commons play into that or inform that policy of what, could be, what can be shared and, and when it can be shared under the kind of grant mechanism? framework? So this is a very really good question um, and it, some of you may be familiar with the, the, the rather uh, strong separation between intramural and extramural research at the NIH but in the data science particularly in the data sharing process those two areas get it blended quite quickly. Um, we envision that, that, uh, that publicly funded research and the data deriva the data generated through publicly funded research should be available to the public. That's an open science framework. So having said that, we need to find ways to help investigators in an efficient way be able to make their data shareable. And that is the basis underlying the, the idea of the commons. There will be a safe place for the data to reside. Now, if we start thinking about the 18,000 NIH funded projects that are going on in this on this very day. That's a lot of different data sets to archive and to and to think they will they will continue to be growing. So we would expect that there will be that not so much from the Commons, but from our through our Office of Science Policy and through our uh, the materials in the uh, funding announcements and in the call f in the the the, um, the guides. We will have uh, att we, there will be guidance regarding how to prepare a data set for a deposit, how to determine which parts of a data set need to be shared, um, how to uh, identify um, the, an acceptable uh, uh, storage uh, opportunity for a data set because we don't envision ever requiring that all data generated in all NIH projects be only stored at the NIH, but rather that we foster the use of appropriate types of archiving for the data and appropriate types of discoverability. I must comment for just a moment on the idea of what we call deaccessioning data sets. When a data set is no longer actively used or actively in need, we need to have policies in place that describe what happens next. Does it go to a more long-term storage environment? Does it remain in an index? Um, do, we need to re do we need to retain all of the modeling that was done with the data set to ensure that it can continue to be used. Those questions now are going to require extensive comment from the community as well as as, proposed, as plans developed here at the NIH. That's great. One uh, question that sort of, this is sort of a two-pronged question, if you'll indulge me for a second, but uh, we've got a number of questions about this, so I'm trying to synthesize. Um, I, I just personally, I always think you mentioned the FAIR principles, and uh, we don't need to go into what they all mean, but I've always uh, kind of secretly felt that uh, there's a silent E on the end of FAIR uh, that you don't hear, but that E stands for education and training, and that the role of education and training in data science is absolutely fundamental to uh, not only uh, helping people who are not biomedical scientists, but from you know, statisticians and, and uh, computer scientists get into looking at these very rich sources of data. Um, I want to hear a little bit more about what you feel the role of education will be, but also how that touches on the role of trust, which you also mentioned in terms of public outreach. I think now we're about what, two, three weeks after the March for Science and the notion of trustworthiness in science and maybe some distrust from certain you know, portions of the, the American population. I think that's an important role and I want to hear what your thoughts are on that. Well, you don't become a data scientist at the PhD level. You have to begin thinking about data science from the K-12 experience. So we are partnering with the NSF to look at how we can influence 
uh, strengthening the foundation for data science in the K-12 education program. Um, children who are exposed to probability theory in fourth grade or some nuances about algebra by the time they're in the sixth grade will do much better in the future and we will be able to, to concentrate our university-based data science training with a substrate of individuals, uh, sorry, building on the substrate of knowledge that individuals bring at that moment. Um, but we do. We also have to think about the generations of investigators and analysts and librarians and clinicians who are in their 30s, 40s, and 50s who grew up with experimental models of knowledge building and evidence generation and need to move over into um, complement that, not not replace it completely, but complement it with data science. So. I would envision that we will have, that our, our future training, NIH funded training, will include uh, early career, mid-career opportunities for investigators to get deeper training in the data sciences. We expect to be partnering with the Medical Library Association and with our library colleagues through the Association of Research Libraries to build effective uh, in-the-moment training uh, for our workers who need to have um, access to understanding about data science and where it fits into the process of inquiry but don't have the ability to leave to get another degree. That's great. That's great. Did, did you have any uh, final thoughts on public outreach and uh, with, uh, how the data science commons might uh, help with that? Well, I, I believe that our ability to be transparent in, under, in demonstrating why scientific conclusions arose and the pathways from which they arose um, will enhance the public trust. I believe that at the, the National Library of Medicine in particular and the NIH in general enjoys a great deal of the public trust and so the strategies that we take to make data accessible not only through the scientific channels but also through public libraries is an important part of how we will be engendering trust from the public. At the same time we have to help the public develop uh, numeracy literacy and, and an understanding of, of probabilistic and uh, thinking because uh, and not not at the same depth of an investigator, but we need to move from uh, a society that largely views points as as truisms to understanding ranges and pathways and patterns, so that we don't oversell uh, the 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 result that a particular study or a particular investigation provides. And again, the idea of building a a, a quantitatively uh, a sophisticated public will will require us engaging at the very earliest levels. Well, with that, I'd like to thank you so much, Dr. Brennan, for that wonderful overview of, of NIH uh, data science thinking, uh, uh, the pathway forward, and, and some of the uh, details about how we, you envision that happening. I think this was outstanding, and an outstanding way to uh, end uh, our uh, series of data science seminars um, through funded through the BD2K program, uh, which have been just so wonderfully attended. And so I want to thank all of our uh, attendees for their participation, and uh, any feedback that you have will be welcomed to, uh, to, to receive that. Uh, so once again, thank you so much and thank you, Dr. Brennan. Thank you, John. And I'll, I'll comment on some of the items in my blog if it's possible to do so. So keep watching. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.